Um, although uh, I was introduced and this has the name of our research service, Trusted Sources, on it, I'm here more uh, as an author on China. I just published a new book uh, on China with the title of Tiger Head Snake Tales, which is a Chinese expression meaning something that is very big when you first see it and very impressive and awesome. But when you look more closely, there are a lot of things down on the ground that may not be quite as impressive. And uh, I end the book, uh, and I'll come to this in a sense, this, that China faces so many challenges, I think, at the moment, in addition to its enormous achievements over the last 35 years. But the question is whether these snake tails down there are impeding the progress of the tiger's head and may even come up and throttle it one day. That is a catastrophe theory, which I don't think is going to happen, but for reasons uh, I will say, it's certainly a possibility, something that uh, you have to think about. Because, uh, in a sense, the the progress of China, the enormous material achievements which we've seen since Deng Xiaoping launched economic reform in 1978 have reached the stage, I think now, where the old model doesn't function, isn't functioning very well, is throwing up a lot of pr internal problems in China which have to be dealt with the second half of the unfinished revolution that I referred to in my title, but grappling with those issues, with those challenges, with those problems in a sense, it's very easy to say, ah, oh, China should do this, China should do that. We all know that. I think we can do a laundry list quite easily. And the Chinese leadership know that too. But because of the nature of the system, where everything is interlocked with everything else, where there is no independent uh, or organs of uh, civil civic society, where the law exists basically to serve the Communist Party, etc., 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 we can go into that more. The interlocking nature of this system means that if you deal with one little bit of it, you risk having uh, unfortunate and perhaps unforeseen consequences uh, elsewhere, which is why uh, there has been great caution uh, in China over the last 10 years under Hu Jintao, and now the great question is whether Xi Jinping and the new leadership, which took, started to take over uh, last month at the Party Congress in Beijing, whether they will grapple with these issues with ne short-term negative consequences, there's no doubt, or whether they will prefer to say everything's really all right, keep the boat uh, sailing on, and in three or four years' time uh, they will come to much choppier waters. Uh, I don't want to go back uh, over a lot of history. Uh, as our chairman said, I've written a 880-page book on China's modern history, so I won't try and compress that down into 80 seconds. Um, but I think history is important here in uh, evaluating where China stands today and the kind of the, the mindset, the context, both of the leadership and of a lot of the Chinese people these days. If we go back, of course you'll be familiar with the, the estimation that in 1800 China accounted for one third of global wealth. Uh, clearly the Hai Qing dynasty uh, at the end of the 18th century was in a position of great magnificence, great power, great feeling of self-confidence which of course led it uh, to think that it could just go on with the status quo uh, forever and didn't have to change, didn't have to reform, didn't have to have an industrial revolution or accept uh, external influences, although it was never as cut off as, as some people imagine. We then, if you think, in, 18, in the 1860s, uh, the, the British, and there was great difficulty uh, when the British wanted to establish an embassy uh, with China in Beijing, primarily because the emperor could not accept that there was any other sovereign in the world, Queen Victoria in this case, whose emissaries he should de his uh, agents should deal with on an equal basis. China was superior, there was no doubt, it was felt to be superior. You could come, there were lots of uh, tributary states which sent uh, legations to China and would be well received, but you always had to accept this uh, situation that the Middle Kingdom was superior and its rulers held a quasi-divine status. But in fact, during this period, and this was despite the fact, with the, with the, the difficulties of the British in the, the 1860s, despite the fact that it was more than a quarter of a century since the first Opium War, where China had been roundly defeated, that the British and the French had staged the punitive uh, expedition on Beijing in 1860, where again the Chinese had been completely defeated, where the empire had been forced to give trade concessions, legal concessions, other concessions to the foreigners, but still the Chinese felt superior. 
And the, it's interesting that the current uh, historical narrative, which is approved in China, of the century of humiliation, to explain why China <coughs> fell from that height to <coughs> the problems it had through the first half and a bit more of the 20th century, uh, focus on it all being the fault of the foreigners, the dastardly foreigners, particularly the British, of course. Uh, now, I'm not being entirely revisionist or imperialist in saying this, but actually China's internal difficulties were far greater than those visited on it from outside. The great mid-century rebellions, the Taiping, the Nian, the Muslim uh, rebellions, the whole transfer of power from the ruling dynasty, the Qing, who were foreigners, of course, Manchus, uh, to the Han gentry, uh, the, the financial difficulties, the lack of uh, progress and reform in industry and so on, all those were the real reasons why <coughs> the imperial system came to an end in 1912. We then had uh, a decade of anarchy on a national scale under the warlords. We then had the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek, which uh, the amazing thing about Chiang is that he actually managed to survive for so long. Uh, the regime was split, uh, there were regional revolts every year, there were huge invasions by the Japanese, uh, there was corruption, there was lack of any kind of real state system for much of this period, <coughs> and yet China uh, did survive, but it was on a downward trajectory uh, at that point. Then we had Mao, the first revolution, brought about really by a military victory rather than uh, a social rising, I would say, although the peasantry obviously was important uh, in that process. We, we then had uh, the disasters of the Mao period, uh, the Hundred Flowers anti rightist campaign uh, in the mid-50s, uh, uh, then the Great Leap Forward, the Great Famine, and the Ten Years of the Cultural Revolution. So by the time we get to this man, Deng Xiaoping, taking over in 1978, China had gone through a pretty awful century, century and a quarter, century and a half. And I think the recovery from that uh, terrible period is very important in uh, uh, really contributing to the kind of stability <coughs> which China feels the need of today and also the position of the Communist Party. Deng Xiaoping, after he'd won the power struggle after the fall of Mao, he didn't wake up one morning and read an economics textbook and think, hmm, this is a rather good idea, let's have a bit of market economics here. Uh, he saw that China was in a terrible state after the Mao period and that, <coughs> in addition, Mao had virtually destroyed the Communist Party as an effective organ uh, of rule and of government. Deng was a great patriot who wanted to rebuild China as a great power, but he also was a lifelong communist. He joined the party as a teenager in France, and he wanted to ensure that the Communist Party was the was, was the, continued to be the monopoly power in China. And what he saw, his, his great, one great insight, was that through pursuing economic growth and using market mechanisms uh, for that, you could both rebuild China as a great power by drawing on abundant cheap labour, cheap capital, and then external markets whose demand made up for the weakness of China's domestic consumer market. And that on top of that, by using the Communist Party as the vehicle that brought this progress to China, he could ensure continued rule of the party. So the basic uh, equation for Deng was actually political, not economic. It was using economics uh, for the party. And of course, this went through vicissitudes uh, in the 1980s. He came back, then uh, relaunched uh, economic reform uh, in 1992 with uh, his southern tour. And that led us to uh, this pattern, which we've seen uh, in this century, this is since uh, 2007, uh, which is of remarkably uh, sustained economic growth. It looks quite up and down from that point of view. We have the big drop uh, at the end of 2008, brought on by a combination of domestic and external factors. But the extraordinary thing is here, growth, and this is quarterly growth, in no quarter since 2007 has growth fallen below 6.8%, uh, which is an extraordinarily, uh, in a sense, stable and, and high level. And that is what China has got used to. And that is what the whole Chinese equation, sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing again, is based on. And that has given the Communist Party great strength, I think. Uh, one can uh, disapprove of many, many of the things the Communist Party does uh, in many of its policies, notably in human rights, 
uh, and the refusal to have any meaningful dialogue with anybody uh, who doesn't accept its monopoly rule. But it has been able to claim uh, credit for this great economic growth. And as I say, looking back to the year, the century, century and a quarter before 1978, to say implicitly, look what things were like in the past. Isn't it better now? This is the best time, broadly, as a generalisation, to be Chinese that it's probably ever been uh, at the moment. So you've had economic growth. You have relative stability in Communist Party terms. We still have 150, 180,000 protests every year in China. But those are localised protests. They're over police uh, misbehaviour, over corruption, over land grabs, over the environment, over bus fares going up, over all kinds of things there. But they're all disjointed. They're not anti-regime protests as such. There's no protest, uh, single protest movement uh, in China today. National unity has been preserved. Um, I would say, uh, and I'm sure the... Uh, um, this like, one of those goes down very badly in China, but China actually runs the last major colonial empire in the world uh, through the military uh, co conquest of Tibet and Xinjiang and holding on to that. But for the Chinese, this is national unity, and the Communist Party uh, has brought that. Um, nobody uh, that I've met in China wants to see Tibetan independence or Xinjiang are breaking away and everybody welcomes the way in which Tibet as uh, Taiwan is gradually being brought back uh, into the Chinese fold after Hong Kong and Macau and there is indeed the lack of opposition in China the Nobel Peace Prize winner is famously in jail for 11 years for having organised a petition in favour of democracy that's what happens to you in China but what uh, if you organise opposition uh, but what the, the party has done uh, very successfully is to substitute materialism and material progress, advancement, for politics in China, particularly among the middle class, which is why we haven't had the kind of middle class opposition uh, to the regime which was widely predicted. If I can drop a name, although you have many name, big names here, so why do that? When I was editing the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, I was at a small dinner party with Bill Clinton. That happens to you when you're a local editor of the paper. <laughs> uh, and he said, we've, he was just on his way back from China, and he said, we have to encourage Chinese economic growth. This was just before China was going to the WTO, uh, because if it has economic growth, it will breed a middle class, which will bring a much more liberal political system and uh, the move for democracy, which we have from the middle class in Europe and the United <coughs> States in the 18th and 19th century. Well, that hasn't happened because ever since the Three Represents doctrine was adopted by the Party Congress in 2002, the middle class has been co-opted into the system and is actually very well looked after by the regime. Uh, class warfare was abolished in 2002, and that's wonderful to say, no more class warfare. Uh, and uh, if I was a middle class family member in Shanghai, whatever I might talk or think about, uh, if I had, have a nice apartment, I have a company car, I have a second family car, my children go to private schools, I have private health care, I have two holidays uh, a year abroad, etc., etc., on which we buy some luxury goods that we don't buy in China because the luxury tax is 30%, so we use duty-free shopping rather. I'm living quite a nice life like that. The last thing I want, from my purely selfish point of view, is for 600 million peasants and poor people to have the vote. So the middle class is actually, for the moment, a conservative uh, force in China. Uh, if it shows signs of uh, unhappiness, and we've had several... Uh, demonstrations in the last year to 18 months by middle class urban residents. Usually it's about the environment but it's actually about property values, uh, more to that. The government always gives way, always uh, cancels the petrochemical plant or whatever else because the middle class has to be kept on side. And that accounts in large measure for the lack of opposition plus the old legalist system which goes back to the first emperor. People say, you know, China's run by Confucian on Confucian lines. Well, actually, legalism has always been just as important, which is basically you use the force of the law to scare everybody stiff so they don't uh, form an opposition. On the other hand, there are a whole series of weaknesses uh, which we've had, uh, and which Wen Jiabao, the outgoing Prime Minister, Li Keqiang, the incoming Prime Minister, and indeed Xi Jinping, in his remarks at the end of the Party Congress, acknowledge. There are the wealth disparities in China, 
which are enormous. The poor have got less poor in China over the last 30 years, but the rich have got richer even faster. And I'm not sure whether you're familiar with what's called the Gini coefficient, which measures wealth disparities. And if everybody's absolutely equal, it's zero. If everybody's completely unequal, it's one. So it's a fairly sort of small range. And just this week, uh, there was a report that the, the Chinese authorities have stopped issuing the Gini coefficient when it got to 4.5. They stopped giving that. But uh, some academics have done work on it, and the report was just published two days ago, and it's 6.4. And that is far higher than in the United States, Japan, or Europe. This is a very, very unequal society. And there are those inequalities and then regional disparities. The coast of eastern China is a, is the cities there are really developed cities in lots of ways, certainly their centres. Go back into Gansu province, Sichuan, uh, Yunnan, other places like that, and you're back in places almost, you know, in, in the, the early part of, of the last century. We have this image of China as super efficient, these huge manufacturing plants of Foxconn uh, in Shenzhen and other places. But I was in Sichuan uh, earlier this year visiting uh, smaller manufacturing uh, outfits there. And it's very, very rudimentary. It's lines and lines of mainly women workers pushing uh, sheets of metal forward. A stamp comes down, knocks out uh, a disc, which will go into a motorcycle gasket. It's all, you know, Henry Ford, before Henry Ford, as it were. Uh, there's the, the, the problem of corruption in China, which <coughs> is endemic. Xi Jinping is launching a big campaign against it at the moment. The question is, uh, will the anti-corruption uh, investigators look into Mr Xi Jinping's own family, who, as Bloomberg showed earlier this year, have made very large amounts of money through their connections. Um, there's the environment, which is an enormous problem, as any of you who have been to China will know, from air pollution, water pollution, to heavy metal, uh, polluted rivers, many, many other uh, areas. It's not just a green issue, if you like. Uh, this has become a socio-political issue, which arises, arouses um, great uh, <coughs> anger. And if you look at the environmental legislation in China, on paper, it's pretty strong. It's very strong. The trouble is, it's left to local authorities to implement it, and those local authorities often have a, a share, a stake, in the local polluting factory. There are many documented cases uh, of this happening. And then there's the whole question of the social evolution of China, which I think is extremely important. It's very difficult to quantify. In my book, I, I go into this in, in, in two chapters, looking at the way society, because of economic growth, society in China has chosen, uh, in, in urban areas at any rate, and particularly among the younger people, has evolved out of all measure. Uh, and these people walk, march to a different drum to that of the Politburo and the Communist Party and the growth of social media. There are 340 million people signed up for social media in China. There's a lot of double counting, but so that's you know, 100, 200 million people who are operating outside the control of the system or of the censors. And how those are dealt, how they will be dealt with is, is a huge uh, issue for the new leadership. These are the nine men who have just stepped down from running China. Uh, you'll notice they're all in their business suits and white shirts and red ties. And you'll also notice they have wonderfully luxuriant heads of black hair. <laughs> I'm very jealous, as you can see. Um, I'm told by a British ambassador, former British ambassador, that there is an official hair dye factory on the same <laughs> You may be pulling my leg. I'm, I'm not quite sure about this. Um, but the thing in China is that as... The, the, the political system has not evolved in the sense of competition, democracy, and it will not evolve there. But it has become managerially better uh, organised now. And the, the system is that if you're at the top in the standing committee of the Politburo, which did have nine members, it's now been cut down to seven, which is probably a good thing for more efficient decision making, uh, you can only do two terms at the top, or you have to retire when you're five years, you do five-year terms, you can do two five-year terms, and when you pass the age of 68, you have to retire at the next party congress. As a result of that, seven <laughs> of these nine people stepped down at the party congress in mid-November, and Hu Jintao, who had been uh, the party leader and state president, completed it by also stepping down as head of the military commission, which his predecessor had held on to for a couple of years. So who was really, it, it's the first time in Chinese history that a ruler has stepped down from all his posts voluntarily. Deng held on to the military commission even when he didn't have an official party post. And I should say, as I'm sure you're aware here, 
people often refer to Hu and now to Xi Jinping, his successor, as President Hu because he is state president. But that is not a very important job in China. And indeed, China's done without a president for parts of its communist rule. The important job is that of Communist Party General Secretary because we are still in a Leninist system where the party is more important than the government. The party calls the shots. The Politburo calls the ultimate shots. And the Standing Committee calls the kind of divine uh, mandate of heaven shots at the uh, the very top. And the party has its own what are called leading groups, which are more important on all kinds of policy issues, which are more powerful (coughs) and more important than the relevant government ministries. So we're in this double system the whole time, which one must always remember. These are the new people. I'm sorry, the, the title is slightly wrong. It should be the ins and outs. Because the ins, Xi Jinping, who has taken over as party general secretary at the Congress and who will become state president uh, when the legislature, which appoints the president, <coughs> meets uh, next March, and Li Zhang, who will become prime minister next March. She is head of what's called the princelings faction. That's to say the offspring of first-generation communist leaders, Uh, Li comes from Hu Jintao's group, the Youth League faction, as it's called, which is left and right don't mean much in China, but it's slightly more to the left. It wants to reduce wealth disparities. It wants a harmonious society. As you can see from those Gini figures, it hasn't made much progress over the last few years. Wang Qishan, who is the most uh, experienced economic administrator in China, was elected to the standing committee uh, in number six post out of seven, uh, but he wasn't given control, uh, responsibility for economic policy. I think because had he done that, he would have overshadowed Li Keqiang. It's a question of balance at the top. It's rather like, if I can go to Britain, it's rather like Gordon Brown. You know, you didn't want such a powerful man running the treasury or the economy if you were prime minister. So he's been put in charge of the anti-corruption campaign. He's a tough operator. And uh, my Chinese colleagues in China, in Beijing, think this is a very good thing because he may actually do something about corruption. The joke uh, that immediately went round on the Thursday afternoon after he was appointed to this post, uh, given the way family connections profit so much in China, is he got the anti-corruption job because he doesn't have any children. (laughs) (laughs) Yu is, he's the head, he's been running Shanghai and he's been catapulted to the top because basically he's kept Shanghai, which had been getting out of control previously, under control of the centre. And then the people who didn't make it, Li and Wang, are both <coughs> reformers who've spoken about the need for economic and social reform, but their way to the top was blocked by the other factions and by the last-minute intervention of Jiang Ximin, the former party leader, who was meant to have retired in 2002, but it came back and started pulling strings as only he can uh, behind the scenes. And then we have Bo Lai, who I'm sure you've read about. Uh, we'll have, he'll go on trial in the next couple of months. It may be a big show trial, or they may do it very quietly, because he could be quite dangerous if he speaks out. Uh, he was running Chongqing, municipality of 32 million people in Western China. He was running his own thing. He was running a populist campaign to get to the top, to get to the standing committee. Uh, he wasn't under the control of the centre, and that is something the Communist Party does not allow. Uh, he was a kind of, you know, a, a regional baron, uh, a warlord, uh, out of control. And when it became known in November of last year that if he got to the top of the standing committee, he wanted control of the police and internal security. And since he'd wiretapped Hu Jintao when he visited Chongqing, etc., etc., he was just too dangerous. I mean, he did, the murdered English businessman, the corruption, all that. Yes, you know problems there. But the real reason was uh, they had to chop the tall poppy down and the death of the English uh, businessman uh, Neil Haywood uh, in Chongqing, which I'm sure you've read about, provided the ideal smoking gun to do that. I mean, you can, and if we had time I would do it, but you can make a whole scenario that the whole case against Bo Lai was a setup from the beginning, and it makes just as much sense as the official case against him. Uh, but he's gone, uh, he'll be tried, and he's a kind of warning now to anybody else, don't try to go and do your own thing. And the trouble with Wang down the bottom was in Guangdong, he was again doing his own thing, talking about the need for reform, bringing in changes in Guangdong, uh, out of control of the centre. And partly for that reason, he's been blocked uh, on his rise to the top. So 
what are the challenges, and why do I say the, the, the uh, revolution which Mao launched originally, which Deng really launched in its uh, current form in 78, uh, why is that unfinished, and what is needed uh, to be done? The economy is unbalanced. It is far too, it's been far too dependent on exports and fixed asset investment. In other words, property, property construction, and big infrastructure projects. Uh, there are the huge regional disparities, the wealth gap. China needs to build up domestic consumption. Uh, it needs, and this sounds ironic for a state run by a communist party, it needs to look after the workers rather better. <laughs> Wages account for about 38 to 40% of national income in China compared to 68 in the United States. Uh, this is communism and capitalism uh, in operation. The people who've done well in the last 10 years have been the, the holders of capital in China, that's to say the big state-owned enterprises. There's corruption and, le and the whole legal weaknesses. You need a legal system. But in China, in May of this year, judges were told that they had to swear an oath of loyalty, not to the country, not to the legal system, but to the Communist Party. Uh, in that situation, you can't have a fully functioning modern society and uh, a commercial system without a legal system. The demographics are turning against China because of fewer people being born, fewer young people coming into the workforce, and older people living much longer. The question is, does China become old before <coughs> it gets rich? Uh, this is a major problem. The environment problem, which has not been dealt with seriously, uh, as I said. The whole social evolution, this is the lack of trust uh, in the authorities and in the whole way society works. There's a saying in China, which I'm sure many of us say in our own country, but it has a particular force in China, only believe something when the government denies it. Um, yeah. and, and that is allied with safety, I mean food safety, to take an example in China. Everybody's worried about food safety. Recurrent food scandals over rotten meat in sausages, over milk, over just about everything else. I've got the two pages in my new book uh, about this. I had five originally, but I started to feel a bit queasy when I started <laughs> writing about the Chongqing pig blood curd scandal, which was pretty horrible. <laughs> um, so, so, and at the same time, a society which, as I said earlier, has been driven by material advancement. It, China isn't run by Marxism or, commun or Confucianism these days. It's run by materialism. As one of my Chinese colleagues said on returning to China after 10 years uh, in the West, he realized that what counted was not who you were, what you did, what you said, how you lived, but what you could afford. He was being judged by what he could afford. Uh, and the famous uh, quote from a young lady on a television dating show in Jiangsu province a couple of years ago, uh, she was asked, uh, what would you be looking for in the young men on this program? And she said, hmm. Well, I'll tell you, I'd rather cry in the back of a BMW than laugh on the back of a bicycle. Now, again, a lot of people might say that, but it, it, it hits, you say that in China, everybody knows this phrase. And then with the, that linked in with the corruption, again, uh, something that's very familiar in China, there was a Southern Weekly uh, newspaper, did a survey of a report and went and talked to a lot of uh, primary school children. What do you want to be when you grow up, he asked them. And one said, I want to be a pop star, I want to be a sports star, I want to be a rich businessman, I want to do this, that, and then one six-year-old girl said, I want to be an official. And the reporter, when he wrote the story, I said, I thought this was wonderful, at last, somebody who, a child who wants to serve the state. What kind of official, young lady? A corrupt official. <laughs> <laughs> because they have all the nice things. So you can see, you know, from the mouths of children. Uh, they can't. There. You have Tibet and Xinjiang, which are going to be unstable, elements of instability in China uh, for as long as the Chinese pretends that the Tibetans and the Uyghurs are Chinese, which they're not, certainly. There are great uncertainties over China's global role. I'm tempted to say China, China doesn't really have a coherent foreign policy. It reacts uh, to different uh, episodes and different events. It wants to ensure continued security of raw material supplies, which it's short of. It wants other countries and the United Nations to keep out of its affairs. But in terms of playing the role of what Bob Zelik calls a, a global stakeholder, commensurate with its economic position as the world's second biggest economy. China doesn't really, I don't think, play that kind uh, of role. There's the question of one party rule. What is the Communist Party for? Is it just a managerial bureaucratic outfit that has to deliver growth? In which case, what happens if it can't go on delivering growth? Is it going to bring in reform? 
Now, reform is needed in China, and I'll finish with this, to, to take a, a, a short laundry list, to the state-owned sector, where the state-owned enterprises are far too powerful, monopolistic and oligopolistic, often very, very privileged uh, in terms of interest rates, finance, market access, uh, and so on, but an essential part of the system. And if you reform them, you start to chip away at the system. Land ownership needs to be privatised in China so that you can form efficient, larger farms. All land is owned by the state, it's given out on lease basis to farmers, and it's all tiny little plots which are inefficient to farm. Um, and on top of that, 120, 150 million people from the countryside are working in the cities at, at any one time in China. And those people, most of whom are 20 to 40, don't know how to farm anymore. So no, you go to places in, in, in the countryside where they have consolidated land into larger farms, but nobody knows how to drive a tractor. They know how to use a, a spade, the old the grannies and grandpas there, but they don't know. They, so you've got this whole question of the land farming. But if you start to privatise land, take it out of the hands of the state, that means the local authorities can no longer requisition land as they do at the moment and auction it off to developers. And 40% of local government, local revenue comes from that, from grabbing land and selling it off. So you've got to change the fiscal system uh, if you do that. You've got to deal with the whole financial system, which is uh, atrophied, uh, controlled, and that is happening to an extent, but it's happening in what's called shadow banking, which risks getting out of control and, 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 and creating a huge bubble. You've got to increase the price of water and energy, which are vastly underpriced in China. Two things China is very short of, result, huge wastage of water and of electricity. Uh, you've got to change the legal system, as I said. So we can go on with, with these. There are huge things to be done. The new leadership knows it, I think. But if you address those problems, you first of all are going to cause uh, economic <coughs> difficulties. In the short term, we calculate, uh, my fellow economist that trusted sources, that if you did those structural reforms over a three to four year period, you'd knock two to three points off growth and increase inflation by three to four percent. Is that a risk? the politicians want to take. China doesn't have elections, but things are very, very politi and political. And above all, if you started on this process of reform, your danger would be that the red flag would no longer be flying uh, quite so high. So the, the priority is to sustain growth, to maintain stability, to maintain power, but at the same time, these huge tests which China has as it tries to evolve itself into the second stage of, of, of the unfinished revolution. And if I were asked uh, to uh, put my finger up and say, are they going to do it? Is Xi Jinping going to do it? Isn't he? My answer would be probably not. Very slowly, the economy will do well next year. That would be another reason for inaction. And the tendency will be to say, oh, we go through economic cycles, things will get better, and so on. The danger is that five <coughs> years down the road, I don't know how many, China will start to hit the buffers because it has not achieved the second half of the revolution. Thank you very much.